When I got my iPad Pro review unit, I actually set it up as brand new. I didn't go in and restore it as backup. And I hadn't realized at the time how many settings I actually changed and how much I customized the out-of-box experience. There's actually a ton of useful stuff in the settings app and a couple other places in iPadOS. This video is sponsored by Bassius. Let's get into it. Now, the first thing I do when setting up an iPad is remove a bunch of the stock apps I don't use. So stuff like tips, weather, photo booth, stocks. They're just apps I don't personally use, so I get rid of them to kind of help clean up the, the app library and also spotlight results. Then I turn on Stage Manager. Me and Stage Manager had a rough start, but after iPadOS 17, it got a lot better. It's not perfect, but it's better. For Stage Manager, I turn off recent apps. Now this doesn't disable it all the way. You can still swipe in from the left to reveal it, but this just gives you more space on the screen. I do leave the dock always visible just so I can jump between apps quickly. I did a whole video about how it works. I'll link to that in the description below. Then I go into display settings and turn off auto lock. I don't want my computer automatically locking after a set amount of time. Besides the fact I never forget to lock it when in tablet mode, and then when I have the magic keyboard, when you close the lid, it auto locks anyways. But on top of that, when I'm doing like Final Cut Pro exports, I don't know how long those are gonna take. I don't wanna have to sit there and move the mouse to make sure my computer doesn't lock. I want it to be able to keep that render going if it's five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes. For notifications, I turn most of them off. If you really think about what notifications you need, there are probably only a handful of apps that you absolutely need notifications on, especially for an iPad. I actually use the device summary notification feature quite a bit for notifications that aren't exactly time sensitive, but for stuff I would still like to see. For all notifications, I turn the sounds off, but there is a better way of doing it than individually going in and turning it off. The way I think about it is my iPhone's the device I'll leave around. So like if it rings, somebody's calling, then fine, it can make noise or buzz my wrist. But my iPad, if I'm going to interact with like a message or something, it's because I'm using the iPad in that moment. And I don't need a ding every single time I get a message coming through on it. I just remember back in the day when FaceTime and iMessage started syncing between the devices and at one point you would just have like three or four devices dinging at the same time and it, it just, it was, it was just way too much. <laughs> on my iPad, I mainly have notifications on for productivity and messaging apps. So for stuff like things, my task manager, uh, whatever calendar app I'm using this week, messages and so on. Now I do have email notifications on, but just for VIPs. VIPs is a feature in mail that you can select for certain people. And this way you can set basically kind of a two tiered list. So that way when VIPs send you an email, you get a notification, but you don't get a notification for everything else. I like this system a lot because there's some people I work with that when they send me something, it's probably time sensitive. This video is sponsored by Bassius. This is the Bassius Magnetic Power Bank. This is a 10,000 milliamp hour battery pack. This magnetically attaches to the back of your iPhone, giving you enough battery life to get through your day and then some. For iPhone 15 Pro Max users, this will charge your phone from zero to 100% and still have some battery power left over. This has 20 watt power delivery, so it's more than enough to charge your phone while playing a game or watching a video. Since it uses standard wireless charging and the MagSafe magnets, you can even connect your AirPods Pro 2 to it and it will stay connected. It also has support for pass-through charging, meaning you can charge your phone and the battery pack at the same time by just plugging a USB-C cable into the battery. On the bottom, there are LED lights to indicate how much of a charge the battery has left. It also is small enough to fit in my jeans pocket. I'm gonna put some links in the description below to where you can go check it out. My thanks to Bassius for sponsoring this video. Then going into the sound settings, I turned all of the device sounds off. There really isn't a reason for my iPad to ding. Like I said, if something needs to get a hold of me, my iPhone is usually dinging or I'm already sitting in front of my iPad so I'll just see the notification. I also make sure these software keyboard sounds are turned off as well. I just can't stand the artificial sound of clicking keys, especially because of how big of a mechanical keyboard fan I am. One thing I got used to that kind of surprised me was the dynamic volume. This is the feature where the volume buttons change depending on which orientation the iPad is in. So the volume up and volume down 
positions swap to be the right position and no matter what orientation your iPad is in. I actually really like that feature. So I leave this setting so that fixed position volume controls is turned off. In settings, general hardware keyboard modifier keys, I used to change the caps lock key to be an escape key because the old Magic Keyboard didn't have an escape key and I always found the caps lock key to be useless and escape key to actually be quite useful. Now the new Magic Keyboard has an escape key, so I'm not too sure what to do with the caps lock key right now. I would love it if Apple gave us the ability to customize modifier keys to be like shortcut keys. So maybe the right option key or the caps lock key could run a specific shortcut. I also turn off auto capitalization, but just for the hardware keyboard. I'm used to traditional typing. In Control Center, I remove the camera option. I just don't take photos with my iPad. I add in the QR code scanner, home, low power mode, music recognition, screen recording, and keyboard brightness. For display and settings, I enable dark mode right off the bat. And then for display mode, I switch it to more space. This runs the iPad at a higher resolution so you can fit more stuff on the display. For home screen and multitasking, I set it so it downloads newly downloaded apps to the library. This way it keeps my home screen clean. I also turn off suggested apps in the dock. This gives you an extra three spots so that you can put apps you specifically want in the dock. The accessibility menu has a ton of great stuff for different users of different needs. In the AirPods section, I turn off head tracking. This is the thing that like if you tilt your head to the left, it makes it so that the audio looks like it's kind of, you know, still coming from the iPad's general direction, even though you're wearing headphones. I don't like that. It bothers me for some reason. I could never get my brain to wrap around that. Under pointer controls, I bump up the scrolling speed on the trackpad. I always found Apple's uh, scrolling speed to be a bit sluggish, especially because like, how am I supposed to 360 no scroll, bro? Lately, I've been using the highlight cursor feature. The gray of the pointer can get lost in my background or dark mode apps. I just use the white option in here and it helps it stand out quite a bit. Under Siri, I enable type to Siri. I don't use the speech version of Siri with my iPad. That is for my iPhone, watch, or army of HomePods. With type to Siri, I can get Siri to do something when I'm out in public or even in my office working, and I just don't have to yell at the device. Plus, with the new Magic Keyboards, you can long press the dictation button and it'll trigger Siri. So this way I can just quickly type a command. For wallpaper, I set it up to rotate through one of the many photos I've taken. Link to my wallpaper pack in the description below. For photos, I have it set to download them and keep the originals, but this might actually change. With the iPad, the biggest storage option is two terabytes, which is a lot. But when I work on multiple video projects right now, as it is, that can start to take up a ton of space. So usually like if I, if I need a little bit of extra space, my photo library is the first thing I ditch and just have it, you know, do the thing where it just gives me the proxy media and not actually the full high resolution stuff. With music, I have it set to stream high quality. While I technically have unlimited data for my cellular plan for my iPad, it's one of those ones that like once you cross a certain threshold, they throttle the speed. So it's, I just don't even want to mess with it. And then for downloads, I have it set to lossless. But again, this is one of those things that might change because it just eats up so much space. And at the end of the day, it's more important for me to be able to have space to do my job than, you know, it is to have really high quality audio that I'm not entirely sure I can hear the difference in. I'm not saying others can't, I'm saying I can't. And then for the Safari options, I go in and set it to show the favorite bar. I don't know why Apple hides this by default. It's so useful. I also enable the feature to show links on hover, which is another really useful feature, especially if you're using a trackpad. What this does is if you hover the pointer over a link in Safari, it'll show the URL in the bottom left hand corner. This could prevent all of those Rick rolls. So those are the settings I change on my iPad. I want to hear from you. If there's a setting you change on your iPad that's different from me, something that like you absolutely have to change or your iPad's unusable to you, let me know what it is in the comments below. My thanks to Bassius for sponsoring this video. If you liked the video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't already, and have a great day.